Chapter Three. When Cindy arrived at English class, Mr. Mitchell fixed his gaze on her. Miss Gibson, he said, his voice seeming to catch on her last name. Cindy braced herself for criticism. I need to see you after class. Great, Cindy thought. I'm back in school two minutes, and I'm already in trouble. She knew he was going to lecture her for missing so much school. When Mr. Mitchell referred to a student as Mr. or Miss, it usually meant trouble. During the entire class, Cindy worried. She kept looking at the clock, counting the minutes until Mr. Mitchell would yell at her. Why did I let you drag me to school? She whispered to Jamie towards the end of class. Jamie just shrugged. When the bell finally rang, the room emptied quickly, leaving Cindy and Mr. Mitchell. He was wearing a checkered green tie and a red shirt that contrasted with his dark skin. Uh, Cindy began. I'm sorry I missed so much school, but see, excuse me, Cindy," said Mr. Mitchell, leaning back and pushing his glasses up on his nose. But when you came to Blueford, you indicated cartooning as one of your interests. The other day, I was looking at last year's middle school newspaper. And I found some of your work. It was great. You've got a lot of talent. So I was thinking the Blue for Bugler needs a cartoonist. What would you think of trying your hand at it? For an instant, Cindy turned numb. She had expected to be lectured, not offered a job. Well, yeah, that'd be. I mean, sure, I'd love to do that. Cindy stammered. She had always loved to draw. But lately, with all the problems at home, she had sort of abandoned it. There's just one condition: you can never miss a deadline. If you promise a cartoon and don't deliver, you are off the paper. Are we clear on that? Mr. Mitchell said crisply. Yeah, sure, Cindy said. Okay then. After school, go see Miss Abbott. I already mentioned you to her. She's eager to have you on the staff. Good luck, Cindy. Thanks, Cindy said, stunned. It was the first time since she came to Blueford that she felt excited by something. She couldn't wait to tell Jamie what had happened. Hopefully, I'll be seeing more of you in my class in the future, Mr. Mitchell added as she walked towards the door. Cindy nodded, knowing that he was referring to her poor attendance. You will, she said with a smile. Thanks, Mr. Mitchell. At lunchtime, Jamie and Amberlynn squealed with excitement when Cindy shared the good news with them. "That's great!" Jamie cheered. "One day you'll be famous." "You go, girl!" Amberlynn cheered. "I just hope they like my drawings," Cindy said, feeling unsure of herself. "Of course they will," Jamie replied, reaching for her soda, then taking a quick sip. "This is the best news ever." Yeah, I can't wait to see your first cartoon in the school paper," Amberlynn chimed in. "I'm gonna frame it." Just then, Cindy noticed a boy across the lunchroom watching her. At first, Cindy wasn't sure who he was, only that he was tall with broad shoulders. But then she recognized his face. "Is that who I think it is?" Cindy asked. "Him?" Jamie said, shaking her head. That's Bobby Wallace, the one who tried to turn me into a punching bag. I can't stand the sight of him. Ever since I found out what he did to you," said Amberlynn, rolling her eyes disgustedly. I see the way he sweet talks girls in front of their lockers all the time, like he's so smooth. Well, he's smooth, all right. I'll give him that," Jamie said. But if they know what I know, they'd stay far away from him. He looks different. I hardly recognize him. Cindy said, pretending not to notice him. Bobby continued to stare at her, and Cindy wasn't sure, but it looked as if he was smiling. Amberlynn chuckled. "You've been away from school so much, I'm surprised you remember what Blueford looks like. But that's all going to change now that you're a big newspaper artist, right?" "That's right, Amberlynn," Cindy said, laughing. "Soon you'll have to call my secretary if you want to see me."
Cindy enjoyed the idea that at last she had something in her life that other people thought was cool. She wondered what her mother would say when she told her the news. She hoped Mom would be excited. Maybe, for once, she'd be proud. Maybe she would even skip a night with Raffi to spend time at home. After school, Cindy went to Miss Abbott's classroom. She was a pretty, dark-skinned woman who taught English and speech. She was also the advisor for the Bluefer Bugler. Cindy liked her immediately because she seemed warm and enthusiastic. Remember, Cindy, you're on the newspaper staff now. Don't let me down, she said. No way, Miss Abbott. I'm really excited about this, Cindy responded. I wouldn't do anything to mess it up. Miss Abbott and Cindy discussed several ideas for upcoming issues of the paper. Your first assignment, Miss Abbott said, is to draft a sketch to accompany an article on the cafeteria food. Cindy had ideas for the cartoon immediately, and she shared them with Miss Abbott. They sound great. I can't wait to see what you come up with. Miss Abbott smiled. I can see why Mr. Mitchell recommended you. Cindy was beaming when she left Miss Abbott. School had been over for nearly a half hour, so most students had cleared out, except for those involved in after-school activities. As Cindy rounded the corner of a long corridor, she bumped into a student coming from the opposite direction. It was Pedro Ortiz, a six-foot-tall senior that everyone recognized. Even when she was in middle school, Cindy had heard many rumors that he was involved with gangs. Watch where you're walking, girl, he said as she bounced off his wide chest. Sorry, Cindy replied, turning away quickly. She did not know him at all, but something about him gave her the creeps. He seemed to lurk around Blueford, rarely speaking to anybody. She wondered what he was doing hanging around so late after school. Cindy rushed outside to get away from Pedro. As she reached the Blueford parking lot, she heard a horn honking. She looked up to see a red Nissan not far away. Behind the wheel was Bobby Wallace. Hey, baby, want to ride home? He shouted. Cindy looked around. Surely he wasn't talking to her. Guys didn't talk to her that way. No one other than Mom had ever called her baby before. She started to walk home, but then the horn sounded again. Your name is Cindy, right? Bobby asked. Yeah, Cindy said warily, remembering how Bobby had hit Jamie. Cindy did not trust any guy who could hit his girlfriend. I think I'll walk home. Thanks. You mean to tell me that you'd rather walk than ride? Bobby said with a sly smile. I'd rather walk than ride with you, Cindy replied, picking up her pace. What's that supposed to mean? Bobby Wallace, I ain't new at this school, Cindy retorted. I know about what happened with you and Jamie Wills last year. Bobby parked his car and jumped out. Hey, Cindy, I know where you're coming from, and I don't blame you for wanting nothing to do with me. Jamie Wills has been dissing me, but what she says ain't necessarily so, Cindy. We were both messed up last year. Me and Jamie both were doing some crazy stuff. She's moving on now, and so am I. Give a brother a chance. Why should I? Cindy asked, folding her arms across her chest. Why should I give you a chance? Because I want to get to know you better, Bobby replied, sounding sincere. And I think you want to get to know me better, too. Just give me a chance. Cindy hesitated. Bobby was very handsome, with dark eyes and broad shoulders. Cindy was flattered by his attention. Come on he urged. Cindy was torn. She knew her friends would disapprove if she went with him, but they had all taken rides with boys before. No boy had ever talked to her like Bobby did, and he seemed so sincere. I guess it'd be okay to ride home with you, Cindy said, but you have to take me straight home. Deal, said Bobby. He smiled as they walked to his Nissan, and as they got into the car, he said with a wink, you are looking good, girl. Cindy blushed, embarrassed by his attention. She was glad she was wearing the blue rib tank top and close-fitting jeans. She smiled back at him, her heart pounding with excitement.
I was real tight with Jamie last year, real tight, Bobby said. She was old for her age. I mean, she ain't act like no middle schooler. She had a grudge against the world, and she was out to prove something. Well, we did drugs, both of us, and they messed with my mind real bad. Yeah, I got rough with her, but it was the drugs doing the violence, Cindy. I swear it was the drugs, and now I'm clean. I ain't no fool. I wouldn't mess with no drugs again for no reason. And I wouldn't hit no girl. Never, Bobby said solemnly, pulling out of the school lot. She was really crazy about you, Bobby, Cindy said. She cut out pictures of you playing football. She even made a scrapbook just to look at you when you weren't there. Well, I don't know about that, but I do know that she was crazy, Bobby said. She was into shoplifting and she ran away from home. Like I said, I give her credit for moving on now. I give her a lot of credit for that. Cindy enjoyed listening to Bobby. He seemed friendly and respectful. Nothing like the violent person Jamie had described. She felt flattered to be with him, riding in his car. Bobby pulled up in front of Scoops, an ice cream shop not far from Cindy's apartment. Whatever you want is yours, Bobby said reaching over and running his hand along Cindy's cheek. She was speechless. I know you said straight home, but you ain't gonna stop a brother from buying you some ice cream, are you? Well, okay, Cindy said, smiling. His hand seemed strong but gentle. It was impossible to imagine him ever being violent. Cindy believed what he said. The drugs had made him a dangerous person, but he was different now. You just gotta try this mint cookie swirl, Bobby said. I'll order us both one. Okay, Cindy said, going along with his suggestion. Sitting in Bobby's car, Cindy felt touched by magic. She had not felt that way since she was five and played a fairy princess at a school play, wearing a sparkling tiara and silver slippers. This is really good, Cindy said, tasting the ice cream. What I tell you, I know all the cool spots. If you trust me, Cindy, we can have a real good time together. As soon as they finished eating, Bobby dropped Cindy off at her apartment, and she went running up the stairs to bring her mother the good news. What a day it had been. Cindy could hardly believe all she would have missed if she had not gone to school. In one day, she had become a cartoonist for the school newspaper and... She had a handsome boy show interest in her. For once, she had something that might make her mother proud. She burst into the apartment, eager to share the day's news. Mom, Cindy yelled as she pushed open the door. I'm going to be drawing cartoons for the school newspaper. And some guy... Mom? Her mother usually called to Cindy that she was in the kitchen or in the bedroom, but there was only silence now. It was four o'clock. Mom was always home by 3.30 on Fridays. The laundry room, Cindy said to herself, snapping her fingers. She remembered that Mom always did laundry on Fridays after she got home from work. Cindy raced downstairs yelling, Mom, as she approached the laundry room. But when she got there, the only person she saw was Harold, feeding change into one of the machines. Oh, hi. Cindy said, disappointed. I was looking for my mom. Harold looked shy and uncomfortable. In class, when a teacher called on him, he often looked frightened. Cindy had never known someone who seemed more shy. I've been down here for a half hour, and I haven't seen her, Harold said softly, not looking at Cindy when he talked. Are you sure? Cindy asked. Yeah, I know your mom. She looks like you. She hasn't been down here since I got home from school, Harold said. Thanks, Cindy said bleakly. Heading back to the apartment, Cindy figured her mother must have gone to the store. She could not wait for her to return so she could tell her everything. Cindy decided to feed Theo and Cleo while she waited. As she entered the kitchen, she noticed a note taped to the refrigerator door. Cindy instantly recognized her mother's fancy handwriting. It read, Cindy, 
Raffi won a free trip for two to Vegas, and he just sprung it on me today. We had to leave right away. I'll be home Sunday morning. Plenty of TV dinners in the fridge. Baby, I think my man is going to pop the question. Wish me luck. Love and kisses, Mom. Cindy stared at the note, disbelief and rage building within her. No, she yelled aloud, yanking the piece of paper off the refrigerator. Mom never did anything like this before, she thought, crumpling the note. How could she do this? There had been some all-nighters where her mother snuck back in at dawn, but a whole weekend? Never. Cindy quickly grabbed a can of cat food and divided its contents between the two bowls on the floor. Then she sank into the recliner, her spirits crumbling. I can't believe she did this, Theo, Cindy said. The cat started eating, and Cindy's words were drowned by the silence of the apartment. All the exciting news she wanted to tell her mother instantly faded, leaving an aching emptiness in its place. She had to spend two more days alone in the dismal apartment. She would go to bed and wake up with nobody to even share cold cereal with, and the same would happen the next day. The silence in the apartment seemed to grow louder with each moment. Mom, Cindy moaned. How come you don't care about me? Hot tears welled in her eyes. How come you don't love me? Suddenly, the doorbell rang. Cindy quickly wiped her eyes and walked to the front door, peering through the tiny glass peephole to see who was there. Rose Davis was standing in the hallway. It's me, honey, Rose said. Cindy opened the door and tried her best to smile. I hate to be bothering you, but that grandson of mine is giving me fits. You have that Mr. Mitchell for English class like he does, don't you? Yes, Cindy answered leadenly, hoping Mrs. Davis would not know she had been crying. Well, Harold says that Mr. Mitchell is asking you to write 100 pages for that report, and that don't make no sense to me. What high school student would need to write 100 pages? Will you come explain the assignment to Harold? Mrs. Davis asked. Okay, Cindy said. I'll get my binder where I wrote down everything about the project. Cindy got her binder and followed Mrs. Davis to her apartment. It looked a lot shabbier inside than her own place. The furniture was old and beat up, but a delicious smell was coming from the kitchen. Grandma, Harold complained softly when he saw Cindy. What'd you bother her for? Well, child, ain't you been going on and on about the teacher wanting a hundred pages? Goodness sakes, I needed to get at the truth. Mrs. Davis said. Mr. Mitchell said our paper has to be 10 pages, but that we got to read a book at least 100 pages long, Cindy explained. Oh, Harold said. He did not look at Cindy. He stared at the paper in front of him as though he was trying to make a hole in it with his gaze. Cindy, honey, Harold told me you were looking for your mama. I saw her rushing out of here like... The whole building was on fire. If she don't have time to make dinner, why don't you and her come and join us for dinner tonight? I'm cooking a whole mess of Cajun pork chops and mashed potatoes, Mrs. Davis said. My mom, she's gone. Uh, I mean, she's working late, Cindy replied, ashamed to admit her mother had run off to Vegas with her boyfriend. She especially did not want to tell that to Mrs. Davis who sang in the church choir every Sunday. Well, then it's settled, Mrs. Davis said with a big grin that plumped out her cheeks. You're going to eat with us tonight. Harold, go set an extra plate at the table. Thank you, Mrs. Davis, Cindy said. She was grateful for the invitation, not only because of the heavenly smells of pork chops, but mostly because she would not be eating a TV dinner by herself. That's real nice of you she added. Mrs. Davis smiled. Sit down and make yourself at home, she said. If you want anything, ask Harold. He'll get it for you. I'm going to finish dinner. Mrs. Davis turned and moved towards the stove. 
Cindy walked over to the small kitchen table where Harold was setting a third place. He worked with his head down, as if his chin was stuck to the top of his chest. Despite being in the Davises' warm apartment, Cindy couldn't stop thinking of her mother and the two lonely days ahead of her. She wondered if Mom even missed her. Probably not, she concluded. Pushing back thoughts of her mother, she sat down and looked over at Harold. He was sitting across from her in complete silence.